Good afternoon, gentlemen. We're here with Tom Campbell and Steve Taylor, psychologist and physicist. And let me tell you a little bit about both. Steve Taylor is a senior lecturer in psychology at Leeds Beckett University and the author of several best-selling books on psychology and spirituality. His new book is Extraordinary Awakenings, When Trauma Leads to Transformation. In his book, Disconnected, Steve states, regaining awareness of our connection is the only way by which we can live in harmony with ourselves, one another, and the world itself. His many other books are referenced below in the description. His books have been published in 20 languages, while his articles and essays have been published in over 100 academic journals and magazines. He also writes blog articles for Scientific American and for Psychology Today. Eckhart Tolle has described Steve's work as an important contribution to the shift in consciousness which is happening on our planet at present. Deepak Chopra has said of Steve's work for his book Spiritual Science, a science grounded in the understanding of consciousness as a fundamental reality could be our saving grace. Tom Campbell, physicist, has been a serious explorer of the frontiers of reality, mind, consciousness and psychic phenomena for the last 40 years. Using his acquired mastery of the out-of-body experience as a research tool, Campbell focused his work on discovering the outer boundaries, inner workings and causal dynamics of the larger reality system. The result of his research unites the worlds of objective and subjective experience under one scientific explanation thus achieving the goal of generating one unified comprehensive theory of everything that bridges metaphysics and physics with one scientific understanding his trilogy of books my big toe naturally when i discovered steve taylor's work i was struck by the similar topics of research and focus both tom and steve have pursued although from very different disciplines Steve Taylor's book, Spiritual Science, Why Science Needs Spirituality to Make Sense of the World, will be the focus of our discussion today, because we are here with both a consciousness and spiritually minded psychologist and a consciousness and spiritually minded physicist. Tom's not-for-profit organization, CUSAC, the Center for the Unification of Science and Consciousness, has the goal to bring together those whose decades of research come to some similar conclusions about the nature of our reality, why we're here and what is our purpose? How do we move forward with the goals that will help humanity? Thank you, Steve, for graciously accepting this interview and for being one of those individuals contributing to these positive goals for humanity. Steve, on the subject of purpose and before we get into the topics of your book, Spiritual Science, in your One Garden series on YouTube, Is Purpose a Superpower? You quoted Nietzsche. If you have a why to live, you can endure almost any how. You gave Viktor Frankl, a concentration camp survivor, as an example of courage and a strong sense of purpose and how he helped others in the camp hold on to this sense of purpose. Can you comment on this from your viewpoint as a psychologist? And since Tom's experiments will provide evidence for our reality as virtual, he may comment from his scientific viewpoint. Human beings are naturally purposive creatures. You know, and that's why there is such a strong relationship between purpose and well-being. You know, there, there have been a lot of studies that show that purpose in old age can actually extend our lifespan, as it did. Well, Viktor Frankl believed that it did for him in the concentration camps, and and it did for other inmates of the camps too. And I think the reason for that is that purpose is a facet of consciousness itself. Consciousness is is dynamic. So fundamental consciousness has a, a dynamism ingrained within it. And and that, that manifests itself in evolution. Evolution is a dynamic process, process of, of increasing complexity and connection. So when in our lives we, we align ourselves with that process by attaining a purpose or following a purpose, then it feels right. It feels natural and right because, you know, it's, it's the flow of, of consciousness itself. And it feels wrong to be outside that. That's why people who lack purpose often feel depressed or frustrated because you know they they're not in they're not aligned with consciousness so i think that's why you know growth is ingrained within us it's natural for us to grow and we feel healthy we feel a sense of well-being when we grow tom do you have a comment on that sure 
I agree with Steve, uh, all the things he said. Uh, from my uh, viewpoint, I would say that purpose gives us the arrow of you know, direction toward what evolution, toward growth, toward becoming. Uh, purpose provides us with an idea of whether we're getting closer to where we want to be or getting further away from it. You know, purpose gives us gives us direction and it's the thing that animates everything else. It's important. Now, in, in my work and from a, a more scientific uh, viewpoint, I look at purpose in terms of entropy and entropy reduction because I see consciousness as an information system. It is about uh, absorbing information, processing that information, and making choices. I define consciousness as awareness with a choice. A very simple definition. Okay, now, I model consciousness. Well, it's just a model. I model consciousness as an information system. And imagine an information system with all of its bits being random. There's no information. That's the definition of randomness. There's no information. Okay, then in order to create information, consciousness has to order some bits, find some sort of order, some kind of a pattern. And in that pattern, it can stand for something. It can be a part of language. It could be a number. It could be anything, as long as it has value and significance to the consciousness. So in that way, consciousness evolves by creating order. Now, a measure of disorder is entropy. Therefore, consciousness evolves by lowering its entropy or creating information, creating the word, uh, well, order out of chaos, if you, if you like that. So that gives the consciousness its reason and its mechanism for evolution. It evolves in order to lower its entropy. So it is a system, an evolving system a finite system, not an infinite system, not a perfect system, just a system of consciousness evolving, trying to lower its entropy. And Steve, how would you uh, express consciousness from your observations and your experience? Consciousness is equivalent to aware, both awareness and experience. I'm fascinated by what is sometimes called the pure consciousness event. That's when our consciousness or our minds become empty of content. You know, it's often associated with deep meditation. When we're not perceiving any information from our surroundings, our minds not producing any thoughts, our whole being, whole organism becomes very quiescent. And yet in those moments, we, we become more powerfully conscious than normal. And we we seem to experience a state of pure being, of pure consciousness. So there's still an experience, but it's only an experience of our of our own being. And and of course, in those moments, we realize that it's not really our own being. What we experience as our own being stems from a much deeper source. It stems stems from a fundamental consciousness. So in these moments, we become one with the source of consciousness itself, we become one with fundamental consciousness. And in doing so, we become one with all, our living, all of the living beings, because all living beings, you know, are manifestations of this pure consciousness. And that's why it's such a, an incredibly powerful and wonderful experience to, to become one, to experience the fundamental oneness of all things. Well, Steve, you write and speak mostly about spirituality and psychology, but your research on consciousness and the founders of quantum physics and their references to consciousness in your book, Science and Spirituality, was extraordinary in its detail. Did your work for this book contribute significantly to your fundamental consciousness view of reality? Well, I had a view of reality before I began working on the book. I've always had a kind of intuitive sense, even before I read about these things, you know, even when I was a, a t young teenager, I always had a sense that consciousness is something fundamental. It, it's kind of, it's out there and everything is part of it. It's not something which is produced by the brain. 
and you know, I, I, and I've always distrusted scientists who try to explain science, uh, consciousness as a brain as brain activity, or as produced by brain activity. I mean, they've been doing that for decades now, and they've got nowhere. I think there's a growing realization that consciousness cannot be reduced to neurological activity; it's something more than that. So, so in my kind of most spiritual moments, I always had experiences when I would sense this fundamental consciousness out there in the world, in the sky, or it manifesting itself in natural phenomena, or even man-made objects, they would all seem to be perf- pervaded with consciousness, or maybe you could use the word spirit. And this spirit brought them all into oneness, as if they were all manifestations of, of spirit or consciousness. So I always had that, had that awareness. And when I began to do research for the book, then it, it confirmed, you know, I realized that there is so much evidence from science, from quantum physics and from other areas, which confirms this view of reality, that consciousness is an all-pervading universal force. How did this um, venture into physics and consciousness enhance your work that you do now? I think it's um, it's really interesting that that science and spirituality are converging on the same view of reality. And, you know, still in our culture, there is this viewpoint that science and spirituality or science and religion are opposing forces which cannot converge but in reality and and, and every all, all of the original quantum physicists talked about this they that they were they were spiritual people they are they were keen aficionados of indian philosophy because they knew that the reality that they were unco- uncovering was expressed in a different way in spiritual texts the fundamental oneness of things, the fact that you cannot separate human consciousness and reality. There is no reality out there. It's not an objective reality. It's created by our consciousness. So it's wonderful that, you know, both both science and spirituality are expressing the same fundamental truths. Yes, very much so. You've stated that there are many big questions that seem to be beyond our capability to answer without putting Tom's big toe on the spot too much, what might one of your big questions be you would like answer that his, his theory might offer? <laughs> I, I do think that human awareness and human intelligence is limited. We're, we're just animals after all, and every animal has a limited understanding of reality, a limited awareness of reality. If we could put ourselves into the consciousness of, consciousness of an insect or into the inner being of a, a sheep, we would be aware of this kind of more limited perspective of reality. But it stands to reason that that applies to human beings as well. There are probably some things which are are beyond our awareness because our awareness is limited. Having said that, we can expand our awareness. And I think think that's one of the purposes of spiritual practices like meditation or mystical paths is that they help us to expand our awareness so that we can become aware of more reality. So... You know, the, the the most difficult question, or one of the most difficult questions, which I think faces philosophers and scientists now, and maybe Tom can throw some light on this, is how does matter or the physical world come into being? How, how does it arise from consciousness? Because, you know, it, it, it's, it's certain, I, I think, that consciousness is fundamental and that in some way, the material world emerges from consciousness. But how? I mean, a lot of philosophies like idealism and panpsychism have this view, but they can't really explain how matter or the material world comes into being. Over to you on this one, Tom. Okay, well, that's right down my alley. I can explain exactly how physical reality comes into existence from consciousness. Uh, I have to take a couple of steps to get there, but I'll try to do it uh, very quickly. I mentioned that uh, I model consciousness as an information system. Um, This information system started as one monolithic thing, reducing its entropy as best it could, because that's how it evolved. And of course, the choice there was either evolve or die. If you de-evolve enough, then you end up with all your bits random again, and there is no information. So this evolution is uh, spurred along, just like ours is, by evolve or uh, disappear. 
So it was doing that, realized that it was very limited because it was one monolithic consciousness and that only gave so many things that it could do, that it could think of, and that it, it would uh, have more opportunities for putting more things together. There'd be more possibilities for it to expand into if it took pieces of itself, gave them free will, and then interacted uh, with those things, with free will. And it did that, and it created lots of these subsets, or in computer terms, uh, virtual machines inside itself. And they all had free will, they interacted, and it created the first virtual reality, which was communication protocol, so that these virtual machines and the larger conscious system, of course, the virtual machines are just a piece of this larger conscious system. They are all, all one, um, so that they could communicate. And the virtual reality is just defined as a reality in which there is a rule set. It's defined by a rule set. So a virtual reality is a space in which consciousness can, can interact and it has context for that interaction. It has rules that define the limits of that interaction. And communication protocols now made a virtual reality where all the various pieces of consciousness could communicate like a big chat room. That did not help consciousness evolve as quickly as the system would have liked. Uh, a big chat room just doesn't have a lot of real meaningful, you know, uh, choices. So it realized it had to create another virtual reality with a little tighter rule set that defined more um, interesting, more meaningful choices than just communications. So it did that because it is an information system and because it had, during its evolution thus far, created mathematics, because that's a very simple thing for an information system to do. It has ones and zeros, and it can count the ones and count the zeros and into numbers and so on. So basic arithmetic and all the rest of mathematics flow kind of naturally from an information system playing with its options and its uh, things that it can, it can manipulate. So then it takes a piece of itself and configures that let's say, as a very rough computer. That's just a portion of this larger conscious system, just like the individuated units of consciousness are portions of the system. Now, it gives that computer initial conditions and a rule set, punches the run button, and the initial conditions change according to the rule set. Now, you've all heard of this as the Big Bang. You start with a plasma, high energy, high pressure, high temperature. The rule set is what we call science. And when you push the run button, that plasma begins to expand and cool and form suns and planets and yada, yada. You know how that story goes. Eventually, you have a virtual reality that's sort of like ours. And you've done that now in this computer called consciousness, part of the larger consciousness system. It's done that. It has that ability. So now, eventually, you have creatures there evolve within that simulation, and they're humans, and they make very interesting choices, matters of life and death choices, choices with moral and ethical content, choices by which lowering entropy is very important. So pieces of consciousness, these individuated units of pieces, log on to these avatars, and they play the avatar. In other words, the consciousness makes all the avatars choices. So the avatars are interacting according to the rule set, our science, and the consciousness now are making all the choices for a particular avatar. So the larger conscious system says, all right, uh, Donna, you can make choices for this avatar, and Steve, you can make choices for that avatar, and so on. And eventually, most of the Avatars now have players that are individuated units of consciousness. Now, from the viewpoint of the inside the virtual reality, the consciousness is non-physical and the computer is non-physical. Both of these exist outside of the virtual reality. Inside the virtual reality seems to be physical from the viewpoint inside the virtual reality. 
from the viewpoint of consciousness, the physical world is simply a virtual reality, a very convincing one. Okay, so there's some interesting things here. So if we are avatars, you know, Tom Campbell's an avatar, the body is an avatar. Now the player of Tom Campbell is Tom Campbell's consciousness. That's the player, makes all Tom's choices. So Tom is not a body. Tom is a piece of consciousness. The physical world is a virtual reality, a computed reality. Now, one might think, well, that's a hard thing to do. If you start at the bottom and you uh, do all the computations, you know, with all the elementary particles to particles to, you know, atoms to molecules and on up into the material world, that would just be a really hard thing to do. Well, it would be a ridiculous thing to do from a computer science viewpoint. You wouldn't do that at all. You would do a probabilistic and statistical simulation where you simulate things in terms of the probabilities. Now to do that, okay, you would have to know, um, well, let me, let me back up a little bit. In a, in a bottom, in a bottom up kind of simulation that I'm talking about, uh, you would have the rule set, which would be mostly deterministic with some natural uncertainty in it but that that rule set would always tell you what the next thing would be you'd always know what the next thing would happen because it would just evolve out of the rules if this happens now then the rules say that this is our next state and indeed physicists believe that they think that if they had all the you know state vectors of all the particles they could predict the future from then on okay but that is a foolish way to do work it's much better to let those rule set generate the probability distributions from a, at the macro level, then just run the, run the uh, simulation from probability distributions. In other words, I can, make a, I, I can make a very simple model that takes one billionth as much computer power and is just as accurate and just as credible and believable to whatever degree of accuracy I wish from a probabilistic and statistic model. So our, our reality is based on probability. And the way that the computer knows what's gonna happen next is it does a random draw from a probability distribution of the possibilities. In order to do that, it needs a database of what those possibilities are. I call that the probable future database. Okay, now the ancients called that the Akashic Records, but it's a database that the system has to have in order to run its simulation. So I've gone through that very quickly. I've left out a hundred things. There's all sorts of details. Uh, for instance, the uh, anthropic principle, you know, we have five constants or so you know, called cosmic cosmological constants. And if any one of them changed in a 10th decimal place, the whole universe would be unstable. And we wonder why that is. How do you get these constants to be so tuned to each other? How could that happen with random processes? Well, it couldn't happen with random processes. So that's why they call it the anthropic principle. Sounds like it was made just for us. Well, it was. And the way you get those numbers tuned like that is, you know, big digital bang, take one, oops. That exploded, big digital bang take two. Oops, now let's turn gravity down a little bit. Uh, big digital bang take three. Now let's turn it back up just a tad. And so on, until you've done that thousands of times and all of those parameters in the rule set now have been tuned to each other. That's why you get all those constants like that. So this, this model uh, tells you what is the physical reality? How does consciousness produce a physical reality? It, produces a virtual physical reality, which as we know, can be just as detailed, just as convincing, and just as accurate as what we call physical reality, the physical unit. So the physical universe is a virtual reality run within the consciousness system. Its purpose, everything has a purpose, is to give individuated units of consciousness some real meaningful, serious experience so that they can learn to grow because for them, lowering entropy in a social system means caring for each other. It means sharing 
It means cooperation. It means love. That's the point. And in order to do that, they need some challenges. And that's what this virtual reality does. It's much better than the big chat room. So that is how consciousness creates matter. There is no matter. It's just information. And most of the, of the particle physicists will tell you that. They'll tell you that their science leads them to the conclusion that our physical reality is information-based. Quantum physics tells us it's information-based and that it's probability. So if you take this model, now I know it's a very, you know, out there kind of a model, right? We're living in this virtual reality created by consciousness, but this model will not only explain the things like the uh, anthropic principle, it explains all the unanswered paradoxes in science. It says, you know, the speed of light changes in just a little bit every so often. It explains why that happens. It explains all of these outstanding things. It explains where does mass and time come from? Is time real? Is that a real thing? And, you know, where does space come from? Why is the universe accelerating away from us? You know, we're all accelerating apart. Why do these things happen? And where does it come from? It explains morality. It explains uh, uh, people in their subjective world. It explains everything in the objective world. And when I first made the model, I thought, eh, okay, it's a model. But as time went on, I could, I could solve more and more problems. And then I ended up with a model that has solved all the basic problems of a lot of fields, it solved a lot of problems in philosophy, in physics. It explains all of physics. Uh, it unites uh, quantum mechanics and relativity, explains why C is a constant. So all of these things, you know, what's going on when that particle collapses to a physical particle? Well, what's going on is that's a random draw from the probability distribution of the possibilities. That how, that's how that's done. So one judges a model on how well it works, not whether it actually, you know, represents common beliefs. So anyway, that's a model. Now, all models are just models. You know, I'm not saying this is the truth and will shall always be the truth forever. It's a model of reality. And models are judged on how well they can answer all the things that are known facts. How can they explain them? Can they explain new things? And then do the experiments that verify that those new things exist. Yeah, it's, um, explanatory power is really important. Yeah. Um, and, that's one of the things I, I suggest in spiritual, in spiritual science is that materialism or physicalism does not have very much explanatory power. Yeah. No, it doesn't. It, it can, you know, there, you are, ask there, a there is a massive range of phenomena which it cannot explain. It, it cannot explain psi phenomena, near-death experiences. It just tries to, you know, cast them aside as, as illusions or, 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 or fraudulent experiences. But uh, can't, Steve, it can't even explain its own basic things. You can't. Uh, you ask a <laughs> physicist, "Where does time come from?" And they'll say, "Oh, yeah. well, I don't know. It's an illusion." It can't, where it does can't mass explain come? consciousness. Where does it mass certainly come cannot from? explain consciousness. Yeah. Where does space come from? Where does spin come from? Where does charge come from? Yeah, Those it, are all the basic things. It's actually a really, it's actually a really poor model of reality. Yeah, it's it's amazing that it's 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 come to be so widely accepted. I guess mm. because it's quite simple. You know, it has a, a, a kind of simplistic appeal, but as um, you know, and it, and it seems to, it seems to transcend the simplistic religious view of reality. It seems to replace that. But mm -hmm. yeah, if you look at it in detail, it, it's it's a really poorly. You know, it has really poor, poor foundations. It's based on a whole load of unwarranted assumptions, so it doesn't work at all as a, as a model of reality. And I, I, I put the model I suggest is called I call it pan spiritism, which is similar to to your model. I guess I guess the only difference or the most significant difference is that I don't suggest that the the physical world is uh, a virtual reality or is unreal or illusory. I suggest that it has its own kind of ontological reality, and that um, you know it's a dynamic expression of, of fundamental consciousness. I suggest that fundamental consciousness has a, a certain dynamism which is inherent to it, which expresses itself in in you know the emergence of 
of matter and the increasing complexification of matter through physical processes of complexification and through evol the evolution of life itself. But um, yeah, I've, I, maybe it's partly temperamental, but I've always been slightly, you know, I've never really taken to spiritual or scientific models that suggest that reality is in some way illusory. Like, there are lots of spiritual philosophies, like the kind of a radical Advaita or non-dual philosophies, which suggests that the world is a kind of dream in the mind of Brahman or something along those lines. Yeah, but there are other spiritual yeah, philosophies kind of saying the world is an illusion. Yeah, there, but there are other spiritual philosophies that, that suggest that the world is not an illusion because all things are infused with Brahman. Everything is infused by spirit. Everything is a, a manifestation or, or a product of, of consciousness. And therefore, they are real because consciousness itself is real. And they are infused with the, re with the reality of spirit. And that's how it appears to me subjectively. Anyway, I know, I know we shouldn't really rely on our subjective perceptions, but that's how it appeals to me. When I look at natural phenomena, I see them as being infused with spirit. I, I, see, I see them as dynamically real. And, and, and that's why they're so beautiful. So, yay, but, we have a slightly different perspective on things. That's all right. <laughs> but, you know, you've got the the basics down and your, your chapter 12 of the spiritual sciences the spiritual science, the spiritual universe moving beyond materialism. Research for all psi phenomena cannot be accounted for in materialistic terms. And there's boatloads of evidence for the psi phenomenon. But as, oh, yeah. as a fa fan of Shakespeare, you, you've got my attention. There are more things on heaven and earth than are dreamt of in a philosophy. You got my, my, my seal of approval on that. Um, mm. How would you like to take your work further? Um, quickly, we're we're running a little bit low on time, but how would you like to take this research that you've done in science and spirituality a little bit further? I'd like to, my, my plan is to write a, a book purely, a philosophical book purely about pan-spiritism. That will probably be my, my next book, one book. I have it sort of, you know, vaguely planned in my mind that, I'm going to try to explain how um, the material world can arise from consciousness mm -hmm. and, I'm, and explore the metaphysical and philosophical implications of the theory. I'm going to explain how mystical or spiritual experiences are essentially uh, a connection to our fundamental source, our fundamental consciousness. I want to explain how psi phenomena can be explained in these terms. I, I do that already in, in spiritual science, but I want, I want, I want to make make it more of a kind of purely philosophical book. So I want to establish pan-spiritism as a, a genuine and, um, you know, serious contender for a metaphysical explanation of, of everything, you know, explanation of human, of human experience, explanation of the natural world. And so yeah, I, th I think it, it can, it will, it can compete with other philosophies like idealism or pan-psychism, uh, dual aspect monism, they're all these are all attempts to explain reality in non-materialist terms. Yes. So I think eventually hopefully panspiritism will be accepted in similar terms. It is your view of it, and that's what's important. And you connect to what Tom's theory is on the most important levels. So this has been fascinating, and I I really hope we can get back together for more discussions on this topic. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. It's it's been a lot of fun. Thank you, Steve. I've enjoyed Thanks, uh, uh, listening to you and chatting with you. Yeah, great. I look forward to um, reading more of your work. Thank you. Thank you so much.